Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to lecture number 13. So today we're continuing our discussion about bijections and bijective correspondences between infinite sets. And just because uh, this theory is sort of new and different from what we know about in the case of finite sets, I'll just start by maybe recalling some of the key ideas and the key example from the last part of, of yesterday's meeting. So last part of lecture 12. So let me try to do that. So we say basically, basically our, 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 uh, our interest here is really in infinite sets. And, you know, and when we're thinking about infinite sets, we kind of have to basically sort of abandon any intuition that we had for finite sets. So this is basically recall recollection from lecture 12, which was yesterday. So we say that a pair of infinite sets, this is true for a pair of finite sets as well, but I guess there are in some ways easier ways to decide if a pair of finite sets have the same cardinality. So a pair of infinite sets have the same cardinality. And you know, our intuition tells us that that means they have the same number of elements, but there's this slight problem that we can't talk about the number of elements in an infinite set. So to decide if two sets have the same cardinality, we have to kind of try to do it by comparing them to each other somehow, because we can't, you know, we can't determine their, their, their numbers of elements. They don't, they don't have a number of elements. So a pair of infinite sets have the same cardinality. So if in the, Kind of official language if there is a bijective correspondence between them. Okay, that's a bit of mathematical lingo that if you're familiar with it is quite handy, but if you're not, it probably doesn't really shed any light on what we mean by saying the two infinite sets have the same cardinality. So if there's a bijective correspondence between them, and what that means is that it, and this is I think quite a useful way to kind of think about it in a, you know, um, in your mind, the term bijective correspondence is sort of very useful when you're trying to describe something in writing or in a formal way. But what it means is that it's possible to match every element of once of each set with an element of the other one. With an element of the other one. So that everything gets matched exactly once. So every every element of each set has exactly one sort of companion in the other set, and nothing is there's no duplication, nothing is used twice, and nothing is omitted. So, so it's possible to match every element of each set with an element of the other one in such a way that so that every element of either set has exactly one kind of companion in the other. Exactly one matched, whatever, companion or partner or something. I like the word companion, it's a bit informal, but that's what we mean. That we can, so a bijective correspondence is exactly that, like an association of each element of one set to an element of the other one, so that this association is completely unambiguous. It goes both ways, and every element in either set has exactly one matched element in the other set. And so this is a, you know, this is a sort of big thing to do, I suppose. We're, we're dealing with infinite sets, they have infinitely many elements. We can't sort of go through the entire list and sort of match everything to something else. So if we're going to be able to do this or demonstrate that it can be done, we have to have some sort of systematic way of doing it that can be can, that can be sort of be verified for, for the whole infinite set without having to go through every element, because that's obviously a you know a physically impossible task when you have infinitely many elements. So the key example that was the first example that we saw was the example of the set of natural numbers n and a set of integers set. And these are two, you know, the two very nice sets. They're probably the first examples of infinite sets that we probably ever meet in our lives, really, uh, especially the natural numbers, which are the positive counting numbers, one, two, three, four, etc. Z is all of that, along with all the negative integers and zero. So Z is, in that sense, a bigger set than N. It includes all the elements of N, but it also includes other stuff that isn't in N. So one observation we can make here is N is the set of all positive integers, one, two, three, four. And I guess the reason that they got the name natural numbers is I suppose they're the first numbers you need if you want to do anything, like, like, like count objects or something like that. Z is the set of all the natural numbers along with zero and all the negative integers. So minus one, minus two, et cetera. Okay, so Z, you know, is a, is a bigger set than n in the sense that it's a superset of n. It includes all the elements of n and also other things. Uh, that doesn't 
tell us anything about whether or not there's a bijective correspondence between the two sets. So that's, that's, that, that's, a, that's a different question. And the question about whether we can establish a bijective correspondence between n and z is basically the question about whether we can take every natural number, so they come already in a list that has a first element, a second element, a third element, and so on. So in that sense, they're sort of manageable in a way. Is that, you know, can we, can we match some integer to one, and then another integer to two, another integer to three, another one to four, in such a way that all the integers get used exactly once, so that every integer gets matched to a different natural number, and nothing is used twice, and nothing is left out on either side. Okay, that's, that's the question. Can we do it? And so, you know, of course, you know, of course you can start doing this. You can say, well, I'm going to match 17 to one, and 23 to two, and minus 14 to three, and minus 37 to four, and certainly you can keep going with that process as long as you want to, if you do it that way, but you're not going to be able to kind of verify if you're doing it in a sort of random way that everything eventually gets used. So you need something more systematic than that. And we saw, how to, we, we saw a way of doing it yesterday, which is the usual one that's quoted. No, it's not the only one, but the integers, you know, they're, if we imagine how they look at the number line, we've got zero, one, two, three, and so on. We've got minus one, minus two, minus three. And the, so, there, so the integers do come equipped with a, with, with a sort of natural ordering from left to right along the number line, you know, in, in, in increasing order. If we attempt to list the integers in increasing order, well, that, that, that's not a bijective correspondence between the, with the natural numbers because there's no first element there in such a list. You know, there's, there's no first integer. There is a first natural number. So, you know, listing the integers in their increasing order is not going to give us a bijective correspondence with the natural numbers. We have to do something else and we have to kind of rack our brains to figure out, well, what could we do to make sure we don't list, any, list anything? And likewise, you know, sort of deciding I'm going to start somewhere like two and then just work to the right is no good because it misses out a whole lot of integers that are to the left of two. So I have to have a way of doing it that kind of, that I know will pick up everything. Okay, and it has to, so it has to pick up both the, the positive and negatives. And a way of doing it, which is the one that's usually quoted in the books, but it's not the only one, is to start at zero. Okay, I, I guess zero is kind of like in between the negatives and the positives, so it's a reasonable place to start. And take a step to the right or to the left, just pick a direction. So let's say you decide to go to the right and go to one. Okay, so what we're going to do is like pick up the things that are close to zero first and work our way out. So rather than going straight over to two, we're going to go back to minus one and take that to be the second thing. So this is saying that in our correspondence, zero will be matched with the natural number one. The integer zero will be matched with the natural number one. The integer one will be matched with the second natural number, which is two. The third thing in our list, minus one, will be matched with the third natural number three. Then we'd step back over to the positive side again. We'd go over to two. So that would be the fourth item in our list, and it would be matched to the natural number four. Then we step back over to the next thing on the neg negative side, which is minus two, and so on. And we keep going in this way. And what we're doing, the next one will be three, and then back over to minus three, and so on. So this is a way of organizing all the integers into a list, which is exactly a bijective correspondence with the natural numbers, which come kind of already pre-organized in the list, one, two, three, four. So I suppose by a list, what I mean is like a list that has a first entry, a second entry, a third entry, a fourth entry, and so on. It can be infinite, but it has to have a first entry. It can't be infinite in both directions. Okay, so when we, when we ask whether we can put some set in bijective correspondence with the natural numbers, what we're really asking is whether we can organize its elements into a list. So this is a concept, I think, that I, it really sort of confused me for a long time. So if, if, if you uh, find it confusing, I'm absolutely with you there. This idea that you could, you know, that, that, that you could take an infinite set of things and organize them into a list. And I don't know if anybody else is in this boat or not, but when I first encountered this, I kind of thought, well, like, you know, why, why couldn't you? What's the problem? Sure, just like build a list of your infinite number of things. Just, just do it. <laughs> but we're going to see next time, next Wednesday, that actually there are infinite sets that we've already met that just have too many elements to be organized into a list which is kind of a weird thing, but, but, but we'll see it next time. So I guess I'm asking you for the moment to kind of bear with this. And I think this idea of why it might be impossible sometimes to organize some infinite collection of things into a list, we'll, we'll see next week an argument that will tell us that, yeah, sometimes, sometimes you can't do it. In the case of the integers, you can, 
And this is one way to do it. You can go zero, one, minus one, two, minus two, three, minus three. And of course, that's not the only way. I mean, this way is easily adaptable to other ways. For example, you could start at one and do the same trick, go one, two, zero, three, minus one, four, minus two, and so on. Same pattern, but starting somewhere else. That would be another way to do it. You could, you could decide you're going to take like, two steps on the positive side, and then two on the negative side, instead of going over and back each time. So once you have a way of doing this, you can adapt it easily to, to other ways. But the correspondence here that we end up with is basically from this, from this strategy. This is, I know that we, we talked about this yesterday, but just in case anyone either missed yesterday or is still thinking about this, was well, basically you'd have your natural numbers. I guess there's a couple of things I want to say about this. And before saying that, maybe I'll just sort of highlight this in the form of a, a, a correspondence. The natural numbers come to us in a already as a, as a list. And that's kind of an important thing to think about, I think, at least for me, when you're thinking about these concepts. You know, the natural numbers come sort of pre-listed. And in a way, the natural numbers is sort of like the quintessential infinite list. They were, they were invented literally to be a kind of abstract infinite list against which you could match things. You know, when you think about counting, and you, I don't know, you kind of visualize early examples of counting throughout history where people are counting their, you know, their, their possessions or their family members or whatever it is, trying to make sure that everyone's there. What, what do you do? Like you invent this abstract object, one, two, three, four, five, and you develop the habit of matching things against the entries of this list. And when you, you know, if you, if, if, if you, uh, if you know you're looking for six things and you match the last thing to, to, to this abstract object, six, then you've achieved your, 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 your verified that all of your things are present. So this, 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 uh, you know, when we ask ourselves, like, what is the natural numbers kind of philosophically? Well, it's, it's kind of the archetypal sort of quintessential infinite list. The objects in it, they're, they're just symbols, names, one, two, three, four, five. But what it's for is for this kind of task of matching things against it when we want to count things. And, you know, that's, that's sort of where the, the natural numbers came from. Of course, subsequently, like they kind of were found to also have a sort of arithmetic life and have our algebraic operations and everything else too. But if you, want, if you only want to use them for counting, that's what they are. They're an infinite list of distinct things that allows you to count any collection of things, no matter how many are in it. And a sort of even, even infinite collection of things, which is what we're talking about now. So that's N. If we put the integers on the other side and we're trying to set up a bijective correspondence, then the suggestion was we start at zero, then take, take one step in the positive direction to one, pop over to the first thing in the negative direction that we haven't encountered yet, that's minus one, then back over to the positive side to the next thing there, that's two, then back over to minus two and so on. And we can sort of, I guess we can be satisfied that yeah, this is a system that allows us to list the integers next to the three and minus three, then four and minus four. There's no risk of having any repetition in this list if we follow this pattern of stepping a bit further away from zero each time and picking up the positive one and the negative one of the same absolute value and then onto the next pair. So it's a, it's a systematic way of listing all the integers without repetition. And that means it's a systematic way of putting the integers in correspondence with the natural numbers. So zero is matched to, the integer zero is matched to the natural number one, the integer minus one to the natural number three and so on, two to four minus two to five. So that is a bijective correspondence between the set of natural numbers and the set of integers, which establishes that these two sets have the same cardinality according to our definition of what it means for a pair of infinite sets to have the same cardinality. So, you know, if we, if we kind of are prepared to take that definition on board and think of it here, like think of that definition as being sort of like a rule of the game. This is what we mean by when we say the two infinite sets have the same cardinality. So it's, a, you know, that, 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 so according to that definition, these two sets do have the same cardinality. So in that context, we can say they sort of somehow have the same size. Um, and, and, you know, quite often in mathematics, we have these sort of formal rules that we're following. So it's, it's, it's in that context that we say these sets have the same, that, 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 that's what, that's the meaning of saying the two sets have the same cardinality. Sorry, I've accidentally, there we go. Okay, so anybody have a question or comment about any of that? Okay, so I guess it's, you don't have to answer, but if you kind of want to, but I guess it's probably new for a lot of people, this, these ideas, and we're, we're going to sort of look, look at more examples and think about them some more. So while we're thinking about it, and, you know, I, I'm going to launch a, a, a poll here in our Zoom meeting, and this is, a, this is one, it's a bit different from other ones, well, it doesn't look too different, but basically what I'm asking you to do here is just 
you know, if you have if you have no idea of the answer to any of these questions, and I don't expect you to have, uh, because we haven't talked about many of these questions except the first one. My suggestion is just just guess, throw out a guess, and we'll see what people think. And you know, there's no there, the answers to many of these questions are surprising to a lot of people. So I don't expect you, you know, uh, that we, at the moment we don't really have any grounds on which to make a reliable guess even about these questions, except for one or two of them. So throw out a guess, see what you think, and we, we're, we're going to answer these questions in kind of explicit detail in the next couple of lectures. So leave that open for a minute or two. Uh, I'll pause the recording for a minute. And here are the results of our vote on these questions. So yeah, they're tricky. And I think the answers to these questions, I'm not, even, I'm not going to sort of say what they are yet because I, sometimes they're, they're, they're not always kind of, I don't know, they don't always match most people's first intuition, I think is a fair thing to say. So first of all, a set of natural numbers instead of integers have the same cardinality. Yes, we just talked about that, that is true. Um, a set of natural numbers and a set of rational numbers have the same cardinality. So we have quite a low percentage of us voting yes to this one. Um, and this is not obvious at all, I think. So I guess I'll make a remark about it, which is, this is the next thing we're going to talk about. But, you know, the set of integers and the set of natural numbers, I suppose, which is the example we just talked about, they do at least kind of resemble each other. So like, you know, the, the, the set of integers looks like kind of two copies of the set of natural numbers, sort of a positive copy and a negative copy, plus one extra element zero. So they're, they do sort of at least resemble each other. The natural numbers and the rational numbers, as we've talked about, really don't resemble each other at all. Like the rational numbers are densely packed into the number line. The natural numbers are spread out sparsely. So they're, so it sort of looks like, yeah, there should be more rational numbers somehow than the natural numbers. That's how that's how it appears in the number line, at least. So yeah, so that one's kind of I, I will give, I will see what the answer is right now, but it's one it, it's a different sort of question, I suppose, from the first one. At least it looks that way. Okay, third one. So we had a high uh, a, a high vote for this one being true. Instead of all rational numbers and the set of rational numbers just in the range zero to one have the same cardinality. And again, this is a like an interesting question that might challenge our intuition in some ways, because the set of rational numbers in the range zero to one, because there's a lot of them, of course, you can pack them densely into that section of the number line between zero and one, but they all fit into that little chunk of the number line between zero and one. Could that collection of rational numbers have the same cardinality? Could it be in bijective correspondence with all the rational numbers, which are spread out along the entire infinite number line? That's a, a question. So nearly 70% of us say yes to that. Uh, I think it's a question that doesn't have an obvious answer, but we're, we are going to answer it and we'll come back to it. Um, set of integers and the set of integers in the range one to 10 have the same cardinality. Okay, no. So I agree with more than 80% of us who said no to that one because there are 10 integers in the range one to 10. And there are infinitely many integers in the full set of integers. But I think this is an interesting one as well to compare to the previous one because, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're talking about integers and if you compare the, the full set of integers to the set of integers in any sort of bounded range, from one to 10 or one to 20 or whatever, that they certainly, you know, if you only have a finite number of integers in any section of the number line between fixed endpoints. So certainly that doesn't have the same cardinality as the full set of integers. The previous question about the rational numbers is different because in any like, chunk of the number line bounded by specific endpoints like zero and one, you do have an infinite amount of rational numbers. So potentially they could have the same cardinality as the full set of rational numbers. And a lot, many of us said, said, said yes to that. And in fact, you're right if you did. So um, we'll see why. Second, that's what the set of rational numbers and the real set of real numbers have the same cardinality. So we have almost a 50 50 split in that one, which I think is uh, kind of good because I don't think we have any basis, most of us yet, for, for, for answering that. Uh, so could it be true? Could it be not true? We'll find out next week. And the final one this, this again is about comparing the full set of real numbers to the set of real numbers in some specified interval between zero and one. And uh, you know, could could the number of could, could the set of real numbers just in that range from zero to one be in bijective correspondence with all the real numbers? Maybe we'll find out. If we if it is, we'd have to sort of try to exhibit an explicit bijection or something like that, uh, which we might be able to, to do. So we'll, we'll we'll come back to that one as well. So yeah, so well done, everyone. Um, lots of, lots of interesting questions there for us to look at, and hopefully maybe it'll be interesting later when we kind of figure out the answers to some of these questions to come back and, and look at these specific questions again. So I'll stop sharing that one for the moment. Uh, move back to our slides. And if, if anyone has a question or a comment, please just fire it into the comments or, uh, or turn on the microphone. Okay, so just back to that example with the natural numbers and the, and the integers. I just mentioned in passing, in case anyone's interested in this, that if you wanted to, of course, you know, about, 
about that bijective correspondence that we established here between the natural numbers and the integers. So it's kind of, it's sort of indicated here, I think, by this picture, this table, which matches like a col the natural numbers in the left-hand column to the integers in the right-hand column, or by the picture above with the arrows going from sort of listing the, the integers. If you wanted to give a more explicit version or a more kind of formal version, I suppose, of exactly how that correspondence goes, you could do it. I, I wouldn't insist on it if you, if you prefer to just give it kind of indication of how it goes by, by giving an, an initial part of the list like I did. But if you wanted to, you could say, well, we have a function from the natural numbers to the integers that takes the natural number in the left-hand column here to the integer in the right-hand column. And we can say what it does if we want to. Like for, and basically, for every even natural number like two and four, it just takes, so if the natural number two is in the left-hand column here, the integer on the right is a positive one over two, or sorry, two, two, two over two. So if you take a function that goes from the left-hand column here to the right-hand column, what it does to the even natural numbers is just divide them by two. The odd natural numbers, well, one gets matched to zero, and, apart, and the odd natural numbers, three, five, et cetera, get matched to the negative integers. So if you wanted to, like you could give a kind of formula that says, under this correspondence, what the kind of companion or partner of each natural number is. And basically, if your natural number n is even, then it's match, its partner in the integers is n over two. So two gets matched with one, four with two, six with three, eight with four, and so on. If your natural number n is odd, then it gets matched to minus n minus one over two, the negative number, which is basically the sort of companion of the, 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 the uh, previous natural number. And that works even for n is one. In that case, we get zero. So that's if you wanted to sort of give an explicit formula for this bijective correspondence. For this example, at least it can be done. So again, I mean, um, if, I were, if I were to ask you about this in an exam or something like that, I wouldn't be insisting on a, a formal description like this. But sometimes, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's useful to be able to do it, and some people like to be able to do it. So this is kind of there just as a, a mention. If you, want to, if you want to, you can be more formal about how you present this bijective correspondence. OK, a couple of very curiosities. And I think these are about infinite sets. And I think these are curiosities for most of us that sort of challenge our intuition. And which is, I think, uh, you know, when you're, I suppose, whatever subject you're working in, whether it's mathematics or something else, you know, when you encounter concepts that kind of challenge your intuition, they also kind of expand our understanding. And that's kind of where you're at the point where you can sort of really make discoveries. And this is true both in the context of any of us as individual students studying an area that we haven't learned about before, and also in the context of sort of how discoveries are made in, in, in the world of research and in the world of kind of intellectual life, I suppose, that, you know, people encounter concepts that, that challenge how they thought about things before, and that's how we discover new things. And that can be true in abstract mathematics, it can be true in physics, it can be true in literature, it can be true really in any field of endeavor. And one of the weird things about infinite sets that we just see already from that example with the integers and the natural numbers is that a set of an infinite set can be in bijective correspondence with a proper subset of itself. So the set of natural numbers is, you know, is the, the, the clearest example of this, I think, because it's the infinite set with which we're most familiar. The set of natural numbers is a proper subset of the set of integers. And of course, that means every natural number is an integer, but not every integer is a natural number. So, you know, the set of natural numbers is a, a part, just a part, not all of the set of integers. Yet, the set of natural numbers can be put in bijective correspondence with the full set of integers of which it itself is a proper subset. And this is sort of surprising. You know, basically you're saying that the elements of this set of natural numbers can be matched with all the elements of this genuinely bigger set that includes all of its own elements plus other stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a, this, it, there's, no, there's no way that this could happen with a finite set, that you could have one finite set contained within another one. And yet every element of each set could have a partner in the other one in such a way that everything is used exactly once because the numbers just don't add up. So, but it can happen for infinite sets. So what we said, yeah, so, so we're saying here, it's possible for an infinite set to be in bijective correspondence with a proper subset of itself, and hence to have the same cardinality as a proper subset of itself. And that certainly can't happen for finite sets because, you know, if you have, a fi if you have two finite sets, let's just, let's just uh, imagine it, that, you know, if you have two finite sets, A and B, So if A and B are finite sets, where A is a proper subset of B, okay, if these are finite sets, then they have the, each of them has a number of elements. So then if A is a proper subset of B, then the cardinality of A is a 
let's just assume that we don't need sets, it's empty. So the cardinality of A is a positive integer that is strictly less than the cardinality of B. So for example, like A might have five elements. And for example, that B might have 20 elements. So there's no way that you can match the 20 elements of B to the five elements of A in such a way that each, everybody in B gets a different partner in A. Like there just aren't enough things in A for that matching to, uh, to, be, to be possible. So, um, so yeah, so this is something that just, just can't happen for finite sets that you could have some kind of, that you could have a bijective correspondence between two sets that have different, that, that have different numbers of elements. And, and of course, if one set is a proper subset of another, then they do have different numbers of elements. So, um, yeah, so the, you know, this, 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 this is totally counter to the sorts of things that can happen for finite sets. If two finite sets have a bijective correspondence between them. So here's one of them. And if it has five elements, then the thing that it's a bijective correspondence with has to have five elements as well, because it has to have exactly one partner for each element of the first set. So, you know, if two elements, if two finite sets are in bijective correspondence, they, they have to have the same number of elements. And that means there's no way that one of them could be a proper subset of the other one. So yeah, so these are these are the kind of things that can happen with infinite sets. And you know, with infinite sets, I guess if you have the integers and the natural numbers, you start doing the matching. You don't run out of elements on either side. So you don't you, you, don't, you don't really run into this same problem that, that you would have if you attempted to put a finite set in bijective correspondence with a proper subset of itself. So yeah, so that, that's one of the curious curious things that can happen for infinite sets that's uh, initially a bit disconcerting, but you sort of get used to it. Like that's how so uh, yeah when you counter when you I guess when we encounter things that initially challenge our intuition, we eventually sort of incorporate them into our intuition because we think about them until we're not surprised by them anymore. So this is definitely one that I think that, that, that rewards a bit, of, a bit of just thinking about, just reflecting on. Okay, anybody have a comment or a question? Okay, if not then, let us move on to the next question we're going to look at, which is well, what about the rational numbers, which in terms of how we talked about it last week, in terms of the geometry of the real number line, looks like a way bigger set than the set of integers. It has all these numbers that approximate any real number as closely as you want and can be packed densely into the number line. So our next question is going to be, well, what about the rational numbers? Are they in bijective correspondence with the integers or the rational numbers? Do they have the same cardinality as those two sets? OK, so a bit of lingo first. So as, as we talked about already, putting an infinite set like the, like the integers in bijective correspondence with the natural numbers amounts to being able to list its elements, okay? Not necessarily in an order that corresponds to any arithmetic order they might have, but a first element, a second element, a third element, a fourth element that correspond to the natural numbers one, two, three, four, and so on. So yeah, putting an infinite set in bijective correspondence with the natural numbers means giving a scheme for listing its elements so that every element turns up in the list. Exactly once. Okay, so a bit of a, terminology. A set is called countably infinite or denumerable. Countably infinite is more frequently used or just countable. If it can be put into in bijective correspondence with a set of natural numbers. Okay. And a set is called countable, either if it's finite or if it's, or if it can be put in bijective correspondence with the natural numbers. So if its elements can be listed. Okay, so uh, generally, generally speaking, the word countable is used to refer to countably infinite things. Uh, but technically a finite set is also Countable. So yeah, the word countable is the one that we kind of need to acquire here into our vocabulary. Um, so yes, yeah, so what it means to be countable if you're an infinite set is that it's possible to list your elements with the first thing, a second thing, a third thing, a fourth thing in the list that picks up so that everything makes it into the list at some stage. Okay, so personally, the, uh, I feel that, you know, I, I, wish the, I, wish, I wish the word that had been invented for this had been listable rather than countable, because I think it would be a kind of or, uh, well, in terms of natural language, I think, I think I kind of think it would be a better description. Of course, obviously, that's not going to change now. The word countable is, is well established to describe this concept, but you know, maybe informally, think of, if thinking about it as listable might be useful because, of course, the elements of a infinite set are not, you know, they're not countable in the sense that you can count them and give an answer, like you can count, this, like, like you can count the number of books on your bookshelf and say what it is. So, you know, but, but countable means they can be organized into a list, into a bijective correspondence with the natural numbers. So the word listable, as far as I know, is not a word in the dictionary, but uh, I think it would be a 
good word to invent for this concept, but it's not, it's not going to happen. But um, yeah, that's, that, that's the concept that it tries to capture. Okay, so we have this word countable now, which means can be put in by decks, which means its elements can be listed. And we might ask ourselves, well, we've talked about the integers and the natural numbers. What about the set of rational numbers, which is sort of the next number system that you can construct kind of arithmetically from the integers when you allow yourself to define fractions and divide by integers. You get the rational numbers. And as we know, the rational numbers are like basically in kind of working life, the, the numbers that we really use to do calculations with. So let's see, what about the rational numbers? Could they be countable? So we've seen that the sets n and z, the natural numbers and the integers, have the same cardinality. And OK, again, remark, this is sort of surprising in the sense that one of them is a proper subset of the other one. But they do have a geometric resemblance in terms of how they appear as points on the number line. They're, they're spread out sparse collections of points. OK, what is, I think, more surprising, and I still find this surprising, even though I've known about it for a very long time. Um, what's more surprising is that the natural numbers and the integers have also the same cardinality as the full set of rational numbers. And again, in terms of like we were talking last week about how these sets of numbers, the rational numbers and the integers really don't resemble each other at all geometrically. The rational numbers are densely packed into the number line. There's an infinite number of them in any tiny section of the number line. Yet we can put them in bijective correspondence, I claim, with the natural numbers. So this is a, a to me, this is really surprising. And it, it, it takes a bit of thinking about it. So, and of course, in order to prove it, we have to ask ourselves, how on earth would you go about trying to construct a list of rational numbers that would collect that would collect every rational number as you travel through the list? And you know, and you know, how do we think about rational numbers? Well, the fractions involving integers, that gives us a bit of hope, maybe, because in a way, every rational number kind of kind of, kind of depends on two integers, a numerator and denominator in its fractional, in a, in a fractional representation of it. Of course, that's not even quite right, because every rational number has multiple representations as fraction, as a fraction, you know, take the rational number two. As a fraction, you can write it as two over one or four over two or 16 over eight or 100 over 50 or whatever. There's loads and loads of different ways to do it. But at least we can say, like attaching to every rational number, we have a description that consists of a pair of integers. And we know that the integers can be listed. So maybe somehow pairs of integers can be listed as well, maybe. You know, if you think about rational numbers as decimals with either terminating or repeating decimal descriptions, I think it's much harder there to see how you can list them. You know, and again, like we said before, you can't list them in their, in their increasing order because, because after each rational number, there isn't a next one in increasing order. That's different as well for the integers. So how are you going to go about trying to find a way of listing all the natural numbers, rational numbers, organizing them into a list? Well, let's just recall here, first of all, in case Q is not immediately recognizable to everybody, this is a set of like, fractions with integers. These are, this is fractions A over B, where A and B are integers. So this is more or less a correct description of what the rational numbers are, except, of course, that the same rational number can be represented by different choices of A and B, like 2 over 4 is the same as 1 over 2, etc. So, okay, that's what a fraction, that's, that's, what, that's what rational numbers are. Okay, so our goal now, if we want to try to, if, if you, well, if you, whether you believe or not, the claim that the rational numbers can be organized into a list. Uh, the, we, well, if we make such an assertion, we better try to justify it somehow. So how are we going to go about trying to organize the rational numbers into a list? Well, and again, you know, the way we did it for the integers was to write them along the number line and, get, and kind of use this idea of starting somewhere, zero was the obvious place to start, switching over from the positive to negative side and organizing them into a list that way that, that would include everything. We can't organize the rational numbers along a line in the way that we can do it for the integers in that sense. Not that we can't, not, not that they don't exist along the number line, but because the, uh, there's no next rational number after each rational number. So, you know, we, we can't list them in order along the line, which we, which we can do for integers. And we kind of use that by switching over and back from the positive to the negative side and going to the next one each time that hasn't been met yet. So that, that won't work for the rational numbers because there isn't a next one that hasn't been met yet at each point. But we can organize them into a, a sort of array. So uh, let's take a bit of time for this. It's, it's probably not obvious where this array is coming from. But rational numbers have denominators. And we can, the rational numbers, of course, can be positive or negative. 
but we can always imagine them so that our fraction is written so that if it's negative, it's the numerator that's negative and the denominator maybe is, we can always take to be positive. So rather, rather than looking at this slide, let me introduce another slide and write it down again so that we can construct it and see where it came from. So the idea here is to write all fractions into a kind of rectangular array. And the first row of the array, we're going to write fractions that have denominator one. So we're, 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 you know, any fraction can be written so that its denominator is a natural number. You know, if, if, you're, if you're talking about the fraction minus three over five, just think of the minus three as being the numerator and the five as being the denominator. And you can do it that way. So kind of uh, fractions with denominator one, we can write them along a line as zero over one, one over one, two over one. Oops, sorry, that was a, that was a uh, slip of the pen. Two over one, three over one, etc. And that goes on. So of course, the, of course, these are just the integers, but they're written as fractions with the denominator of one. We've got minus one over one, we've got minus two over one, and so on. So we've got a list, a, a list of all the fractions that have denominator one, and that's just that's just the list of the integers. So in the second row, we'll write a list of all fractions that have denominator two. And we're going to write them so that the numerators are constant along columns and the denominators are constant across rows. So we write zero over two here under zero over one. So we have a kind of column of things that have numerator zero. And of course, those two represent the same rational number zero, but ignore that for the moment. Just don't, don't, don't worry about it. We'll have one over two here. We'll have two over two here. And of course, that's the same, that, that number has already appeared as one over one. But again, forget, forget, don't, don't worry about that. We're not claiming that all the things in this array represent different rational numbers. Uh, we've got minus one over two, minus two over two, and the list continues, minus three over two, et cetera. Denominator three in the next, denominator three in the next row. Uh, we've got zero over three, one over three, two over three, three over three, minus one over three, minus two over three, zero over four would be here, one over four, and so on. So we can do that, we can fill up an array like this with all the with, with fractions and you know i think hopefully uh, we we can probably agree that every fraction appears somewhere in this array like the fraction 3 over 17 will appear in this column consisting of things that have numerator 3 and it will appear in row 17 it'll appear again as 6 over 34 in the 34th row and in the column consisting of things that numerator 6 so in fact not only does every fraction, every rational number appear in this array, but actually every rational number appears in this array multiple times for all of its, all of, all of its equivalent representations as a fraction. So, okay, fine. So we can do it. And I guess the uh, advantage of this is that we can at least organize the rational numbers into some kind of systematic picture where it's not quite a list yet, but where, where you know, where, where we know where to find something and you know if you if you think of the rational numbers in their natural order from left to right along the number line of course that's also an organized way to sort of represent them but you can't sort of separate rational numbers that are that are close together in their in their in their numerical value easily they're just packed in together there, there, there is a space between them this is a way of kind of organizing them into a sort of thing where it, which you could possibly which sort of resembles a list at least in the sense that things are sort of separated in the, in the thing so it doesn't answer the question of how we list them. So this is, I suppose, a depiction of the rational numbers that sort of resembles the depiction of the integers from left to right that we used to organize them into a list. So it's, it's, it's an infinite array. It's not infinite in the upwards direction because it does have a first row, but it's infinite in the downwards direction. It's infinite in many rows, and it's infinite both in the left and right directions. It's infinite in many columns in both directions. So the idea of how we might use this to organize the rational numbers into a list is to basically start somewhere up there in the first row. And let's start, let's start at zero, zero over one. Of course, zero is there multiple times, but let's start at the, the, uh, the copy of zero that's in the first row. And see if we can find a way of organizing these things into a list that picks up everything. And a way of doing it, again, not the only way, is we can take a step to the right of zero and take this one to be our second thing in our list. This is item one in our, this is, that's item one in our list. This is item two in our list. Then take a step downwards. We get the rational number one over two, which will be the third thing in our list. And again, I'm not saying this is the only way to do this, but I want to have a sort of systematic way of traveling through the array that picks everything up 
I think that we can argue we'll take everything up as it proceeds. Then we can take a step back over here again to zero over two. Okay, we already have that number in our list because we already have zero, but never mind. Just pick it up as an entry in this array and then keep going. Take a step over here to the negative side. Pick up that one. We've missed some things in the first row above that, so go back up. Pick up that one. Then take a step left. Pick up the next thing there. Then go down again and do another kind of loop around the bits that are already done. So go over to the right until you enter the column corresponding to two. You haven't been there yet. Go up, go up again, and then do another loop, like consisting of all these things, and then another loop back over, and so on. So very much analogous to the way that we did it for the integers, just stepping over to the left and right, right and left, picking up, traveling further away from zero at each point. We can do a similar sort of track through this entire array that sort of picks up these loops one after the other. That's supposed to be depicted in the next couple of slides. There it is. I don't know which of these pictures are better, they're, they're the same picture. So, so yeah, so this is a way of organizing all the entries into this array into a list that starts there at zero, kind of the zero, the, the, the zero of the first row, and, 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 and does this kind of looping through the whole thing following this line over and back like that to take these loops. So everything eventually gets into the set of things that have been done and nothing gets repeated. I think that line actually makes this thing more, more uh, difficult to read than it was already. I'm gonna remove it. So, but that's the, that's the idea, do these kind of loops through the, so it just, again, and I, if you, when you're thinking about this, think about it in the context of our, of our method for, for the integers where we went from zero to one, to minus one, to two, to minus two. It's really very much the same idea, but we're doing it through this two dimensional array. So that's a way of organizing all the entries of this array into a bijective correspondence with the natural numbers. It's still not quite a bijective correspondence between the rational numbers and the natural numbers, because every rational number is here in the list multiple times, but basically by eliminating repetitions, like so just, you know, um, so I'll say this quickly and we'll come back to it next time. So the path through the two-dimensional array determines a listing of all the fractions in the array that starts like this, zero over one, one over one, one over two, zero over two, minus one over two and so on, Does these, doing these loops around. And basically that gives us a bijective correspondence between the natural numbers and this list in which each rational number appears multiple times. So to organize it into a bijective correspondence of just the rational numbers without repetition and the natural numbers, basically the idea is that we can sort of, you know, as we go through this list, if you encounter a rational number that's been encountered before, just sort of, throw away the repeat encounters. So at this point, we've got zero over one, one over one, one over two. They're all just different rational numbers. Zero over two has already been appeared in the list at, at zero over one. So we've got just erased the second appearance of it. Then we get minus one half, we haven't had that yet. Minus one, haven't had that yet. Minus two, haven't had that yet. Minus one here, we have had that. So we drop out the second appearance of minus one and so on. So, I mean, I'm not saying that you can physically do this for the entire list, but we can, but this, this list of rational numbers with repetition can be reduced to a list of the distinct rational numbers by just eliminating the repetition. And uh, yeah, so that's the, that, that's the uh, conclusion then, that the rational numbers are countable. They can be put into bijective correspondence with the natural numbers, even though they're densely packed into the number line, even though in any particular bounded region of the number line, we have way, way more rational numbers than integers. In fact, in any like finite region of the number line between, let's say, 1 and 20 or whatever, we have only a finite number of integers and an infinite number of rational numbers. Nevertheless, the rational numbers actually have the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers and the set of integers, which is, a, well, to me, still a, a, a surprising and a curious thing. OK, that is probably a good place to stop and let you think about some of that before we meet again next week. So I'm going to stop the recording here and thank you very much to everyone who's joined us for the recording and see you next week.